Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Lisa Coleman. I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU. I'm very happy to be here with you today, and we're very excited about this program. Thank you for joining us. We know that the room is loading and that people are still coming in. Uh, so we uh, thank you very much to all of my team. Uh, I lead this amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation. I can't say enough about this team. They are tremendous and have done uh, over this course of this uh, pandemic, of course, as we left campus, just an amazing job. So thank you to all of them. Before we get started, uh, we have closed captioning today. You can access captions by pressing the CC captions toward the bottom of your screen. So uh, in your Zoom box uh, at the bottom, you'll be able to see CC. And if you press that, you'll get the closed captions. I wanna begin uh, by saying that I hope everyone's taking good care. For those of you who've heard me before, uh, you know that I've said this quite, quite often. Uh, some people have been saying this is the new normal. This is not normal, uh, but it may be that we have to right, deal with these kinds of disruptions and the uh, legacies of so many things. And so I just hope that everyone is taking good care of themselves. We're experiencing the exacerbated uh, disparities of xenophobia during this pandemic. Of course, we've seen the pervasive and persistent systemic uh, patterns of anti-Black racism and violence in the United States. And we've seen the disparate impact on so many communities. I want to share and just say initially, uh, thank you also to our frontline workers, to all those people who've been keeping us safe wherever we are, as some of us went home uh, to shelter at home, also to remember that except for some of us, home is not a safe place. Um, and for those who keep us uh, safe, right? So those who are cleaning up, those who are delivering our groceries, all of those people, thank you. We could not be here without you. I would also like to take a moment to honor those who come before us, our ancestors and the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. I want to honor those whose lives have been lost uh, historically and also in the most recent acts of uh, anti-Black violence and other types of violence, uh, those known to us and those unknown. So please join me for 10 seconds of silence in recognition. Thank you very much. I would also like to uh, take this time to thank our partners, including the uh, university libraries. Thank you for us, for uh, partnering with us to increase access to the Summer Reads selection. Uh, in particular, thank you, Austin Booth. Uh, of course, you're a great partner, and thank you for all of your partnership in so many ways. And of course, to Dr. Uh, Karen Jackson Weaver from the OGI team for your work in creating the supporting materials that we're excited to share with you. And again, of course, I just wanna thank my team because all of the materials and things that you will receive later, uh, they will be helping me with. So let me uh, begin by saying today, we're pleased to welcome you to today's NYU Summer Reads Conversation with NYU professor Kenji Yoshino, uh, which is part of our NYU Be Together initiative. Be Together is a change-making effort. This was announced in June by President uh, Hamilton and the Board of Trustees. It's one of the initiatives focused on making global change across NYU's global network by innovating, acting, and transforming together. This is the time to take action. We build our building on some of the climate and work that we've done here at NYU uh, so that we can build on our foundation and we can grow and reimagine the places in which we sit. Recent media coverage, of course, has uh, brought much needed attention to the persistent violence and racism uh, against Black people, the xenophobia directed toward people of Asian descent, the disparate impact on women and LGBTQ+, in particular trans communities, and sparking calls to action across the nation and globally. These instances have been foregrounded in fault lines and disparities that for some seem new, but for many of us, it is not new. It is our reality. And we have been living in these situations. And so as we've seen the protests across the nation, um, we at NYU are engaging these and we're engaging these through our readings and through our discussions and through our resources. 
Such oppression is not new, it is ongoing, it's deeply rooted and woven into the fabric and systems of our practices. And it emerged thematically, even in our own, be, uh, being at NYU assessment that we did uh, in 2017. Our work is central to strengthening our NYU community and, uh, and we will continue to do that work. We are accelerating and we are, uh, of course, addressing all of the issues and at OGI we continue to work together to address these exacerbated legacies of racism and structural inequities. We hope that coming together in collaboration with our students, faculty and staff, we will be able to make new changes, new ideas and promote new ways of being. It is up to us to make changes now. It is up, up, up to us to take action. And we are uh, encouraging everyone to join us in this project. In additional uh, efforts, uh, we should let, I should let you know, of course, uh, thank you to all of you who have joined us for some of our other programs. In June, uh, as part of our NYU Be Together, we hosted a Juneteenth program in conversation with NYU professor Rachel Swarns and Dr. Jackson Weaver uh, participated in the conversation as, uh, with me as well. Uh, and that we also had a panel discussion on blackness, racism and protest with professors Kirk J. James, Jennifer Morgan, both from NYU, Dr. Christina Greer from Fordham University, and Timothy McCarthy from Harvard. Uh, thank you to all of those participants who have, um, of course, uh, participated in all our programs thus far. In May, we held a panel discussion on coping with uh, and contextualizing anti-racism and pandemics. Uh, and thank you to Sebastian Chang, Samir Z uh, Okazaki, and William Tsai, and Joyce Tan. In addition, operating within our global context, we have ramped up all of our resources. Uh, we are receiving lots of hits on our website. So we have our responsive dialogues and training guide, our anti-racism and microaggressions, our Global Inclusive Leadership Management Institute, and all of the programs. I will say this at this point, uh, some people have asked this, this comes up in the questions. We have lots of trainings, lots of activities, lots of programs. Um, please subscribe. Some of them are oversubscribed, uh, so you might get in a queue, but we will get back to you as soon as possible. We've also continued our global engagement and training through uh, inclusive teaching seminars, our faculty seminars on race and pedagogy, and of course, our a digital inclusion toolkit. Uh, we know that members of our disability communities have been differentially impacted as well. Uh, we released our digital inclusion toolkit at the beginning of June, and we of course are releasing another one um, as we enter into the new semester. Thank you to all of our global inclusion officers across all of the schools. Uh, we appreciate all of the work that you also are doing to help us um, make, this, make this work uh, uh, impactful across the university. As I mentioned before, NYU Summer Reads is part of this Be Together initiative in partnership with OGI and the NYU libraries. Uh, we've offered three texts for reflection, discourse, and engagement toward advancing equity and justice. Uh, the texts complement the NYU Summer Reads assignment uh, of Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, and we, uh, and we know that we will be have lots of programs and initiatives focusing on Just Mercy in the fall. Uh, just Brian Stevenson, of course, is one of our NYU professors out of our law school as well. The three uh, readings that we have on uh, conversations include, and thank you for joining us for those of us who were able to join us for my conversation with Dr. Nell Irvin Painter on her book, The History of White People. We held a conversation with her on July 8th. That is now available on our website as long as, as well as the reading guide uh, and discussion um, uh, guidelines. Today's book covering the hidden in the salt on civil rights by, as I already said, our NYU's very own Kenji Yoshina. And I'll introduce him in just a minute. And then uh, on August 6th, I uh, will be having in conversation with Matthew Fry Jacobson. We will primarily be discussing his book, uh, Whiteness of a Different Color, but we will also review some of his other texts, Barbarian Virtue, Virtues and Roots Too. Uh, on many of those texts are about immigrancy uh, and the construction of whiteness. So I hope you all will join us again for those. In setting up for the Q&A, we're here as again for the conversation. So before we begin our conversation, we will be taking live Q&A. Given the size of our audience, uh, we have over 700 people signed up for this. So we will uh, be going through the questions, identify questions, and I will ask as many as I can of Professor Yoshino. Uh, of course, we might not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will provide some information uh, post this conversation, um, integrating the answers and questions where we can. Uh, so now it is time for me, and I am very excited about this. It is time for me to introduce Professor Yoshino. It is my great pleasure to honor and to welcome 
uh, Professor Kenji Yoshino. He is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law and the Director of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. As a graduate of Harvard, A.B. summa cum laude and Oxford, as a Rhodes Scholar and Yale JD, he specializes in constitutional law, anti-discrimination law, and literature. He is the author of three books, Covering the Hidden Assault on Our Civil Rights, A Thousand Times More Fair, which, more fair, excuse me, what Shakespeare's plays teach us about justice, and Speak Now, Marriage Equality on Trial. Yoshina has published in major academic journals, including the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, and the Yale Journal. He has also written for popular forums, including the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and he makes regular uh, appearances, excuse me, on radio and television. He's been on places He's been featured on NPR, CNN, PBS, and MSNBC. In 2011, Yoshino was elected to the Harvard Board of Overseers for a six-year term, serving as the president of that body from 2016 to 2017. He has also serves on the board of the Brennan Center for Justice and on the external advisory panel for diversity and inclusion for the World Bank Group. He has won numerous awards for his teaching and scholarship, including the Bottle Distinguished Award Teaching Award in 2014, the American Bar Association Silver, Silver Gavel Award in 2016, and the honorary degree from Pomona, Pomona College in 2018. And on a personal note, it is just a pleasure to have Kenji uh, on our faculty, a pleasure to have him, uh, to be able to work with him. And so thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for accepting my invitation to be in conversation. And, I, uh, and now we will begin this conversation. So, uh, Kenji, it's nice to see you. It's wonderful to see you, Lisa. It's a joy to be here with you. Time with you is always good for me. Thank you. So we're just going to jump right in. And so given what, um, given what, uh, so I've already done this introduction. So I'd like just to, to begin by talking a little bit about how you came to write the book covering, right? What informed you coming to make that decision? Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to run a little bit long. I promise my other answers will be more succinct, but I think it would be useful to set up uh, the content of this book a little bit. So uh, I think it was Nietzsche who said that all academic work is unconscious and involuntary autobiography. And I don't know if that's actually true for all academic work, but it's certainly true of this particular work uh, because I really came about it through personal experience as a gay man. So you know, I went through three different phases uh, when I uh, was growing up, and I'll describe them as conversion, passing, and covering. So in the first phase, I, unfortunately, like many, many LGBT individuals, just prayed for conversion. I wanted this to go away. So I came to uh, the realization that I was gay relatively late in life or acceptance of that fact uh, when I was at Oxford. And the only routine forays I made from uh, my rooms was to go to the college chapel where I prayed to gods I wasn't even sure I believed in for conversion to heterosexuality. And it's actually very difficult for me now at this distance to remember that young man knelt down in prayer because to see him clearly is to feel the outlines of my present self grow fainter uh, in a way. And it was only after I left Oxford and I went to law school that I exited the conversion phase and just accepted that I was gay didn't try to uh, convert anymore. Uh, but I was very, very mindful of the career consequences of being out of the closet. So this is now 1993. Right? And I was closeted to all of my classmates when I began law school. And fortunately or unfortunately for me, that was the very first year, my 1L year at Yale Law School. It was the first year that the law school offered a course called Sexual Orientation and the Law. They didn't have faculty with expertise to teach it, so they outsourced it to a gentleman named Bill Rubenstein, who's now a Harvard Law professor, but who was then teaching, uh, or rather working at the ACLU Lesbian and Gay Rights Project. And I remember literally shaking when I went to his office and I said, you know, I am gay. I know that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to take your class. There's no guarantee that you'll ever offer it again uh, during my time in law school. But I am terrified because I'm not out broadly to the law school community. And I know, given that this is such a tiny fishbowl environment, that the minute my name goes up on that seminar list, people will just assume that I am coming out. 
right? And then I'm gay. Because at that time, again, this is the early 90s, the only people who would take a class titled Sexual Orientation and the Law were gay men, lesbians, bisexuals, and then a very few sort of righteous, you know, straight women, right? You know, but, you know, a straight guy at that time period wouldn't be caught, you know, within 30 miles of a class like that. So I would effectively be outing myself if I signed up for that class as a man, I thought, and I turned out to be right. And he said, and I'll never forget uh, these words, he said, um, you shouldn't take this class. And I was shocked because I thought he would just say, you know, have the courage of your convictions. You know, you really need to take this class. And he said, you should come out on your own schedule rather than on the schedule of an institution. But he said, you know, you're, you know, taking contracts right now. Uh, you understand what a contract is. So I'll make a contract with you. If you keep up with the readings, I will, you know, meet with you however often you want to discuss those readings with you. And, you know, if you're too embarrassed being seen coming in and out of my office, I'll meet with you in any classroom in the law school and, you know, talk to you about the materials. So over the course of that semester, which is the spring semester of my 1L year, uh, I really had a transformative educational experience. And I resolved that this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, that I wanted to be an academic and a scholar of inequality. And I particularly wanted to focus on LGBT issues and the law. Now, unfortunately for me, you can't be a uh, you know, roaring activist for gay rights if you insist on remaining in the closet as a gay man. So by the end of the semester, I was totally out to uh, all of my classmates and I never looked back. But where this book comes about was that, you know, after I came out, it was as if a lead overcoat had fallen off of me. And I really felt like I had plugged into a new source of power. I think many people feel this way after they uh, come out of the closet of, you know, there's certain, you know, harms and sensitivities and insecurities that you have, but there's also a lot of power in being yourself. And that's kind of my mantra about authenticity, that when we're authentic, we actually can draw on sources of power that were unavailable to us. So I don't actually think I was the smartest person or even the most committed person in my law school class. But 18 months after I graduated, I was offered a tenure track job at Yale Law School, which I accepted. And I attribute a large part of that to the fire that was in my belly. You know, I knew what exactly what I wanted to do. There were a bunch of, you know, horrendous anti-gay laws out there. And I was actually taking them down one by one in my scholarship. And people could see that I had, you know, an academic agenda and they could see the arc of that agenda. But mark the sequel, Lisa. Once <laughs> I arrived at Yale Law School, a very friendly, very well-meaning colleague put his arm around me and he said, Kenji, you'll have a lot easier time getting tenure here if you are a homosexual professional than if you are a professional homosexual. And I knew exactly what he meant and others said it to me in much less elegant terms. What he meant was I would do much better if I downplayed my sexual orientation and was like the mainstream constitutional law guy teaching the dormant commerce clause and federalism and separation of powers and judicial review, rather than if I was the gay professor who was teaching gay rights classes and writing on gay rights subjects and engaged in gay rights activism. Right? But what was so fascinating for me was that I didn't have a term for that. I knew what conversion was. I knew what passing was. You know, conversion is when you want to change your identity. Passing is when you want to hide your identity. But I didn't understand the term for what it was that he was asking me to do. Because what he was asking me to do was certainly not go back into the closet. He was pro-gay and embraced my sexual orientation, had voted for my appointment and all of that. But what he was saying is it's fine for you to be gay, just don't flaunt it, you know? Keep it on the down low. Help us forget that you're gay, right? And I didn't have a term for that. So in true academic fashion, I cast my net out onto the sociological waters and I came up with this term from Irving Goffman, the wonderful sociologist in this book, you know, Stigma dates back to the 1960s. And Goffman said many people who are, you know, unwilling or unable to hide the fact that they belong to a particular group, nonetheless make enormous efforts to uh, downplay or mute, right, their membership in that group. And he called that covering. So only treats it for like a page and a half in this book, Stigma. But when I found it, I felt like an enormous light bulb, you know, went off, you know, over my head. And I thought, this is it. This is what I'm being asked to do. And as I thought about it, 
I really thought if this were only my story, it wouldn't be that interesting. But it really struck me that it was a broader story in at least two ways. So one was, it was not just my story, it was a history of gay people as a whole. The gay rights movement, I believe, has moved through these three phases of conversion, passing, and covering. So in the early to middle decades of the 20th century, gay people were driven into conversion in droves, right? So whether that was through electroshock therapy or you know, aversion therapy, or in extreme cases, even lobotomy or castration, right? Uh, gay people were being asked to convert if they wanted to be a part of society. And it was only in the late, you know, post Stonewall era, roughly, all these shifts are shifts in emphasis rather than uh, categorical shifts, that the covering demand ceded to the passing demand. And I think this is best instantiated in the military's move from the 1981 policy that said homosexuality is in incompatible with military service to the 1993 don't ask, don't tell policy that was like, you can serve now in the military so long as you remain in the closet. Right? And it was only you know, in the sort of late 20th, you know, early 21st century that I think we've moved out of that and into the covering phase where the notion is it's now okay, at least in some sectors of American society to be gay and to say that you're gay, but nonetheless, we're constantly being asked to, to tone it down, to edit, not to flaunt. So one way of understanding right, the you know, response to marriage equality and the push for uh, same-sex marriage is to say, it's fine for you to be gay. It's fine for you to say that you're gay. Just don't flaunt it. Right? And uh, for some reason, equality was experienced as you know, shoving it in our faces, quote unquote. Right? And so I would actually think about the resistance to same-sex marriage as a form of covering demand. The second and more important way of extrapolating beyond my story, which I try to do in the book as well, is that once you start talking about covering, it's really universal. So when you're talking about conversion or passing, there are only certain groups that can engage in that or certain segments of groups that can do that, right? So as a general matter, we believe, right, that say individuals who have religious backgrounds can convert or can pass, right? Many individuals with some disabilities can pass, right? Some members of even groups that we generally don't think of as being able to pass, like racial minorities, can pass, right? But as a general matter, right, conversion and passing are not universally available. Notice what happens, though, when we get to covering. When we get to covering, covering directs itself at the behavioral aspects of identity, and so therefore is going to be universal. Anyone who is outside of the mainstream is going to be asked to tone it down or to edit or to mute that identity in order to be accepted by the mainstream. That's just the social contract of identity politics. So that means covering demands are gonna be truly universal. So whether you're a racial minority, whether you're a woman, whether you belong to the LGBT community, whether you're a person with a disability, whether you're a religious minority, any kind of stigmatized identity is going to be subjected to the demand to cover. So as I'm fond of saying, anyone who is not quote unquote normal is gonna be asked to cover. And in the year 2020, it is not normal to be completely normal across all you know, vectors, right? And so everyone, if they think about it, has been asked to cover. So I would be you know, uh, willing to bet that everyone in our audience today has been asked to cover along some dimension. And I'm not drawing false equivalences between different kinds of covering, but I am saying that it is a universal human experience. Thank you very much, Annie. We'll come back to many of these points. So I'm going to move on to some other questions. And so in, in the text, as you've described, you do provide a very rich fr framework. And as you've said, for understanding that unlike uh, conversion and passing, covering is, a, covering is the strategy, right? And you related to this idea of assimilation available to, to groups. And so, and so you suggest that there are four axes, right? Uh, appearance, affiliation, activism, and association. Can you tell us more about those four axes and how they're fundamental dimensions along which we all mute or flaunt those interlocking social identities and how those might pertain to some of the things we're seeing today? Absolutely. So you see my weakness for alliteration here. And that's <laughs> anyway, but hopefully that will be a useful I'll mnemonic. Share that with you. <laughs> our listeners out there. Right? Uh, so you know, appearance-based covering has to do with how we cover along the axes of, of of uh, grooming, you know, attire or mannerism, right? So a good example of that would come from the disability context where many individuals with disabilities say, you know, I use a cane instead of a wheelchair, for example, 
right, uh, with regard to my motor function disability, because even though it is more painful for me to use the cane rather than the wheelchair, uh, the social discomfort I feel when I use a wheelchair is so great that I'm actually willing to internalize the pain, right, and to say, I'm going to use a cane, even though I'll be in physical pain all day, rather than to visit, you know, social discomfort on other people when I know that that social discomfort is ultimately going to loop around and be visited upon me. So that's a classic example of um, appearance-based covering. And we can think back to historical antecedents here as well of the famous example of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who uh, was in a wheelchair for um, some of his presidency, but who always used to make sure he was seated behind a table before his cabinet entered. So it's more conventionally presidential attributes on white, on male, or in the foreground of the interaction, but that his wheelchair was in the background. So where would we be, Lisa, if he had been more open about the fact that he could lead the free world, you know, from that wheelchair, right? Where would the disability rights movement be, right, today, if he had been able to be more open about that, right? So I think I, that we I, have to think. I, I, have, I have insight into this. I was in a wheelchair for almost three years. And so there's uh, that what you're talking about is where would we be, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's extraordinary that while well, in the abstract, I think everybody would say, of course, we want you to use a paraphernalia that allows you to optimize your human functionality, right? At the same time, that's not what people who are in the disability community articulate about their experience, right? So we're not, we're living under ide our ideals rather than up to them, right? Uh, if we actually look at this uh, with any degree of care. Um, Affiliation-based covering to go to the second axis of covering has to do with how we, you know, change our behaviors in order to preempt unconscious biases or stereotypes that people might have about our identity. So an example here might be uh, the woman who obviously can't, you know, hide the fact or pass, you know, with regard to the fact that she's a woman, but who might downplay her childcare responsibilities uh, to avoid the motherhood penalty, right? So. We've done surveys on this, you know, I've looked at the case law on this. We see report after report after report of women who say, you know, I can't talk about my children. So when I go to a pediatrician's appointment, I don't say that. I say, I'm going to my own doctor's appointment. You know, when I actually have to go to a parent teacher meeting, I don't say that. I say, I have to go to my client meeting. I have to go to a meeting with my colleagues, right? Uh, and so there's something really, um, kind of severe about the penalties that are visited on women. And this is not just subjective, right? There have now been multiple studies. I think about Stanford sociologist Shelley Carell's studies on the motherhood penalty, where she says, um, and this is really depressing, that the same statement, I had a child, is received really differently depending on whether a man or a woman says it. So- And we're seeing, a, and we're seeing a depression, the differential impacts right now with this pandemic, right? Exactly. And I, I sort of want to land on this heavily precisely because it's been exacerbated by COVID, right? Uh, when the work-life life, uh, distinction uh, has been made all the more porous, right? And people actually have to engage in really, you know, mighty machinations in order to keep their childcare responsibilities invisible, you know? I, for example, I mean, you see photos of my kids behind me, but my kids are literally on the other side of that door, right? And I've told them, you know, <laughs> pop us out, you know, until 1.30. So, you know, I'll play with well, you then, but please don't come in, right? And sometimes, Kenji, I, I mean, I've been saying this a lot, right? That we have to be more cognizant of people and the ways in which they're working from home because our new colleagues are, our, our spouses, our children, et cetera. And a lot of us don't have spaces in our home. People are in 500 square feet apartments in New York City, right? And so this point is really, really, I think, you know, important. Yeah, and I, I think that's particularly important too, Lisa, because, um, you know, and I, and I love that we can riff off of each other in this way, because I feel like we uh, can, can freestyle this too. Uh, of like, th there's this notion that Zoom can take place from anywhere, and, and that it's, we're truly connecting from anywhere in the world. But that's not really quite true, is it, right? Because you are Zooming from a physical location. And if you're living in a 500 square foot apartment, right, there's actually this curious effect, right, of like who gets to Zoom from where, right? So who gets to Zoom from the office and who has to Zoom from the kitchen, right? So I've actually encouraged, you know, uh, one of my colleagues at the Center uh, for Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging to write the article. She's an incredibly brilliant sort of feminist. Her name is Jess Moldovan, 
Uh, but I've said, you know, a Zoom of one's own, Jess. You have to write a Zoom <laughs> of one's own, right? Which is a huge Virginia I Woolf. I love it. <laughs> and you talked about how it's so weird, right, that, you know, there's uh, dis there are displacement effects, right, with regard to where women are Zooming from, from with regard to where uh, their, their male spouses, for example, are Zooming from. Uh, and it, she emphasizes it's not personal about her own marriage, right, but she did uh, believe that this is a, a phenomenon. So that's the second axis, which is affiliation. Uh, the third axis is activism, or as we uh, now term it, advocacy, right? Um, and that is um, avoiding sticking up for your own group members, lest you be seen as too marked as a group member, or you make that identity too salient. So this could be you're in an elevator and since someone makes an anti-military joke and you happen to be a veteran, right? And you have to choose whether to speak up or not. So whatever the dimension is, we've all had the experience of having a joke against our identity uh, lobbed at us. And we have to decide what to do. And we're worried about overreacting in the moment and feeling like, oh, we're going to be seen as thin-skinned or humorless or what have you. But we're also afraid of underreacting, I think, if we're you know, self-reflective, right? Because if you don't say anything, then you have to walk around for the rest of the day, the rest of the month, the rest of the year thinking, wow, you know, I really didn't stick up for my group. I didn't stick up for myself in that. And this is part of the problem of like, if, if we don't let these microaggressions go without a check, then it means that that person feels authorized to make the same joke again. And someone who might have less wherewithal to stand up for themselves uh, is, uh, is gonna be harmed by that, right? And then the final axis, um, it, besides, you know, appearance, affiliation, and advocacy is association. And association is how much you avoid hanging out with uh, members of your own group, right? And so, you know, again, we have a little bit of survey data on this through a collaboration I did with a management consultancy, Deloitte. And one of the things that we found was that um, survey respondents would say things like, as an African-American, I'm very uncomfortable having even water cooler conversations with other colleagues, because when more than two or three of us get together, someone will walk by and make an appropriate comment. And we dug into the qualitative data to figure out what those comments were. There were things like, is this an NAACP meeting? Or are you plotting something? Or is this a revolution, right? So, you know, these are very educated workplaces, you know, but nonetheless, you see comments like this flying around. You only need one or two of those before you start thinking, ah, uh, not worth it. Like, I'm not gonna have those water cooler conversations. I'm gonna have those offsite and private on phone calls on Zoom right, privately rather than in the workplace. But those bonds, you know, that we create in the workplace are critical to mentoring relationships, to sponsorship relationships. So these association-based covering demands are quite severe. Thank you so much. So this leads me actually, um, so we had a conversation with Nell Painter uh, on a few couple weeks ago. And so as you, I know you're familiar with her work. And so we talked a little bit about the invention of whiteness and she made some distinctions in terms of construction and ideology uh, and how white, whiteness gets constructed. So can you talk, us, talk to us a little bit about how you see the construction of race and identity in terms of ideology and the law? Because we talked about it very much from science, history, and a little bit around representation. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to really talk about it with you a little bit about how that how that gets constructed through the legal context. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a huge fan of uh, Professor Painter's work. And, um, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to improve much on your. <laughs> but I'll give it a shot. Uh, so, you know, when I was um, uh, reflecting on this, you know, thinking about two cases in 1922 and 1923, it's actually a wonderful story. And Ian, Ian Haney Lopez, a legal scholar, has written a wonderful book, White by Law. Uh, that talks about these cases. But uh, the two cases are called uh, United States versus Ozawa and United States versus Thind, respectively. And it's a time in American history that uh, I don't think um, many people are aware of. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But it's a time in American history where you're allowed to come into the country if you are white or if you are Black, but not if you are Asian. Right? So there are the two Asian individuals who are trying to get into the country and naturalize. You know? So Ozawa comes in as a Japanese national, and he actually engages in all these covering demands. It's actually directly relevant to covering. You know? uh, 
Uh, so, or he engages in covering behaviors and he says, I'm married to a white woman, that's association based covering, right? You know, English is the only language spoken in my home, that's affiliation based covering, right? You know, I send my children to uh, white schools and white churches, you know, so again, affiliation based covering, association based covering, right? Uh, and, you know, I advocate for assimilation. So, you know, advocacy based covering rather than for, you know, a robust Japanese identity. So. He basically says, I'm white, and if whiteness is about skin color, I want you to bring out, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the Benjamin Moore color wheel, right? Because my skin is whiter than the skin of an Italian American. This actually goes to Matthew Jacobson's work, right? Of how, you know, different immigrants become denoted as white uh, when they previously weren't. So he says, if you're gonna call Italians white, I'm whiter than an Italian. And like, my, look at my skin color and look at the skin color of an Italian. And the Supreme Court says, oh, nonsense, you know, this is not a matter of skin color. And, you know, this is actually just special pleading on your part, uh, because we all know, you know, that uh, race is a matter of, you know, bloodlines. And, you know, Caucasians are denoted as such because uh, they belong to a particular bloodline, right? And so you can't uh, you know, articulate this according to skin color, because this is not about the color of your skin. It's about your ancestry. So they reject the claim. Unfortunately for the Supreme Court, there's another plaintiff waiting in the wind, wing <laughs> named Bhagat Thin. And Bhagat Thin is a South Asian right, uh, individual. And he says, well, taking you at your word from what you said just you know, last term, you know, you're saying you know, Caucasians are white. right? But where does the word Caucasian come from? Caucasian comes from the Caucasus Mountains. right? And South Asian Indians are descended from the group that inhabited the Caucasus Mountains. So you can't make this stuff up, right? Like who teaches <laughs> these cases, right? Uh, and very so good. then the Supreme Court has to sort of wriggle out from under this 1922 decision where it said, you know, it's not about skin color. It's not about, it's about ethnicity and bloodlines, right? Confronted with this individual saying, yeah, I have all these ethnographers saying that I am Caucasian. So if it's about bloodlines, let me into the country. And so then the Supreme Court punts and essentially does, I know it when I see it. And they say, race is not defined either by skin tones or by bloodlines, but it is a matter of quote unquote, common knowledge is what the Supreme Court says. So at that point, it's like, no one can win, right? Against the Supreme Court's presumptions about who's white and who's not. And what I find so fascinating just to land the plane on this is that if we fast forward to 2020 and race discrimination cases that are being litigated today, now, just a couple of terms ago, we had another sort of cornrows case, right, or a dreadlocks case where the idea was this aptly named employer named Catastrophe Management Systems, right, said, you know, you can't work here unless you straighten your hair. And then the, you know, a plaintiff in that case, the employee said, you know, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's, you know, discrimination on the basis of race uh, and then litigated on that basis. In my own work, I've said, you know, isn't it so funny that there's a really sharp line in these cases between what I'll call the racial treatment cases and the racial formation cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the racial formation cases are like Ozawa and Thin, where the question before the court is what race are you? And that's the whole subject of the litigation. Yeah. Whereas, and in those cases, the court essentially throws up their hands and say, we have no idea what race is. You know? right, right. But when we toggle over to the racial treatment cases, and the racial treatment cases are cases in which the question is not what race are you, but we all understand what race you are. We just stipulate that you are black, right? Say in the catastrophe management systems case. And the question before the court was, were you fairly treated based on the race that we all agree that you are, right? And in that instance, the court seems very, very certain what race is, i.e. in order to say cornrows are not part of your racial identity, right? It actually has to be operating off, off of some definition of race. But it's already told us, right, in the racial formation cases that it doesn't know what that is. So there's this massive disconnect made possible only because there's such a firewall in between the racial formation and the racial treatment cases. And I would actually, by the way, say the same thing about gender, right? That when we're talking about trans issues and trans litigation, the kind of court kind of throws up its hands about what gender really is. Is it genotype? Is it phenotype? Is it the birth that you were the sex you were assigned at birth? You know, what about intersex individuals, et cetera, et cetera? It's about hormones, right? But when we get to the gender treatment cases as opposed to gender formation cases, 
the court is actually quite confident, right, that it knows exactly what sex is and what sex is not. That's that. I think that's an important distinction, right? That that distinction that you're making between the, the treatment and formation and where we are today. And so, so actually, this actually kind of does lead into my next question, because when we think about right stereotype, which is right how people get stereotyped in these categories, and so if we think about the work of Banaji and Greenwald, right? And I know you know their work. Um, and they, of course, have written, right, about how we base our decisions, right, how we base our decisions on stereotype, basically, and, you know, pulling on the work of Steele and others, and how, how this leads to all kinds of decisions that we make, right, in the law that you've just talked about. So can you talk more about these decisions and how we come to make these decisions, right, through these biases and stereotypes that you sort of already referenced earlier in some of your comments? Yeah, well, I think about, you know, the entire covering project as being deeply, deeply indebted to Mazarin Banaji and Tony Greenwald's work. I mean, they are giants in the field and their work on unconscious bias and the implicit association test uh, was something that I was exposed to very early on uh, when uh, Mazarin and I were colleagues at Yale, right, as she came and gave a legal theory workshop about it. And it was another one of those kind of mind blowing experiences. I've come to think, as I uh, referenced earlier when we were talking about the axes of covering, uh, about how affiliation-based covering is an attempt to avoid unco triggering unconscious biases, I would actually generalize from that. And I, I would think of cover all forms of covering as attempts to circumvent unconscious biases or conscious biases. But in this day and age, I think what we're more worried about right, is uh, the unconscious bias that even people of goodwill are going to have to go back to your a wheelchair example, right? Like I'm not conscious of having any bias against people in wheelchairs, but if I take the disability IAT, it's really clear that I do, right? And so if an individual is in a wheelchair and they know that there's all that unconscious bias out there, what are they gonna do? Well, if they can, they're gonna engage in the self-help, right? Of using the cane instead of a wheelchair, but that's a horrible, horrible, horrible choice that we're putting them to. And the responsibility is on us, right, as individuals who are in the dominant group, right, uh, along that particular axis to say, this is not something you need to change or manage. This is something that we need to change or manage. It's not you who should change the performance of your identity. We are the ones who need to change our biases. So um, you and I had the pleasure of both working at Harvard University and um, and so one of the legal scholars that has influenced me most, maybe she's influenced quite a few people, and one of the people I most admire uh, is Professor Lonnie Grenier. Um, she was the first African-American woman tenured at the Harvard Law School, as you know. And, um, and I'm gonna go back to something we were talking about earlier with Nell Painter's work um, in terms of thinking this concept of citizen, right? And so even when we were talking with Nell about the conflation of the term citizen with whiteness in 1790, Right, so could you elaborate a little bit on this concept? Um, certainly Guinier talks a lot about this. And um, in your book, you talk about this idea of citizen and the idea of too much just justice. So yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about that and who gets to count as a citizen and the implications of that? Yeah, uh, it's a wonderful question. And yes, I'm a huge fan of Lana Guinier, who is also you know a giant in the field. Um, so I think, the best um, point of entry for that is actually this really wonderful quote about too much justice. Uh, so uh, for listeners who may not be um, that aware, because it's a little inside baseball, I think, uh, it is uh, from a 1987 case called McCluskey versus Kemp. And what was at issue in that case is whether or not a defendant in a criminal case could use statistical data, right, to show that there was rampant discrimination against uh, black individuals in the criminal justice system, right? uh, such that he himself should not be subjected to the death penalty as a black defendant. And Justice Powell writing for the court said, we can't accept this kind of data. Like you can talk about what factors may have led to bias in your individual case, but we can't talk about aggregate data that would impugn right, the criminal justice system as a whole, because he said to take this seriously would actually undermine the principles on which our entire criminal justice system is built. And Justice Brennan in dissent said, this is an argument that reeks of a fear of quote unquote, too much justice, right? Cause he's saying 
you're making a slippery slope argument, you know, Justice Powell of saying, if we allow this, then, you know, we'll have to think about racial bias and prosecution tactics. Uh, we'll have to think about racial bias and incarceration rates. You know, there's a whole slippery slope, right, with regard to racism. But he's saying, if that is the slope, then we should gladly slide down it. Because if what you're saying is our entire system is so shot through with racial bias, uh, that we would need to revamp the entire system if we were to allow statistical data like this to be probative in a Supreme Court case, then Brennan's like, I'm all for it. Let's revamp the entire system, right? And so that whole uh, systemic reform may be what's necessary and what this uh, data is revealing. So I actually view one way of characterizing, although it's always dangerous to you know, characterize uh, such a um, huge uh, and um, career and someone who's made so manifold contributions to anti-discrimination law. But I really view um, Professor Gunier's work as being about thinking big and thinking about the question of what would the world look like if we didn't fear too much justice, right? Mm -hmm. So from everything from you know, her, you know, work on affirmative action to her Becoming Gentleman book to, you know, her work on the Voting Rights Act. You know, I think what she's really asking us to understand is that this is not about, you know, individual racism. This is about the system as a whole, right? And which bodies count and who gets to count as a citizen and the polity. I take those to be her fundamental questions. And, you know, if I were to take it at its root now taking it, you know, into uh, my own field of thinking about constitutional law and constitutional interpretation, I would say that if we were to take this really seriously of who counts as a citizen, it really goes to the heart of our constitutional order. On day one, when I teach my required, you know, first year constitutional law class, right, I open um, to a group of students who is incredibly diverse, uh, some of whom agree with me politically, many of whom don't, right? Uh, to say, you know, I just want us to think about uh, what it means that there are so many citizenship-based, status-based exclusions from we the people at the time this document was created, right? So if we look at the, you know, creation and the ratification of the constitution, the only people who counted, right, were white men who were property holders. So what does that mean given we are not that country anymore about that document sway over us? So I will actually cede to none and my reverence for this document. I ha actually have a completely unreconstructed belief in the goodness and the wisdom of many aspects of our constitution, right? But, you know, the one biggest um, kind of criticism I have of the constitution is article five which has to do with how you amend the document itself. Right? Uh, and the amendment procedures are so stringent, don't need to go into chapter and verse, but I think I can actually uh, describe this by saying the entire uh, history of the United States has only seen 27 amendments to uh, the constitution and 10 of those right, occurred right after right, the ratification, namely those are the Bill of Rights, right? So we've only had 17 amendments uh, roughly in the entire history uh, of the nation plus the 10 Bill of Rights. And that to me is, is really problematic. So if we really cared about being we the people, we would allow the constitution to be updated. And even the staunchest textualist or originalist, I think would agree, right? That the document would have more legitimacy. And a lot of these debates about, do we have a living constitution or do we have to revere the text of the constitution would go away and really evanesce if we allowed ourselves to revise the text itself of the constitution without going through these requirements that are so onerous, right? That when someone says, you know, I believe there should be a constitutional amendment about X, Y, or Z, my immediate reaction to that is, okay, you're not serious about making a policy change here because you just said there should be a constitutional amendment and that's a way of tabling or getting rid of a claim about how we should change the way we engage with each other in this polity. So the last thing I'll say on that is that, you know, it kind of broke my heart when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked, you know, uh, do you think that the United States should be a model for the constitutions that are being written all, all around the world now? And she said, no, look to a more modern constitution, like look to the South African constitution or look to another constitution because our two constitutions too old and too hard to amend. 
and someone who loves and reveres and teaches, you know, semester after semester, year after year for 20 years, you know, this document, you know, that really did break my heart because I think that this document is such a good document. It's so many good things in it. You know, in many ways, the founders were ahead of their time and ecumenical and geniuses, right? Uh, but we have to make it more accountable to we the people. And they, nobody can see beyond uh, those, uh, their own blind spots and those status-based exclusions from we the people sort of resonate down the corridors of history and have implications for how we live our lives today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that, again, leads into my next question, because the, uh, right, after covering it, it's the, your title of your book is The Hidden Assault on Our Civil Rights. And last week, uh, we saw C.T. Vivian and John Lewis uh, died. And we also saw, uh, I think it was yesterday, right, uh, Medford Evans, uh, or Emmett, Emmett Till's uh, brother died. And as we know, he, they were all staunch advocates for civil rights. And in your book, you underscore um, this university for the covering demand and how it impacts multiple groups, right? So for example, if we think about the historical underrepresented racial and minoritized groups and the discrimination they face, some of the things we've already talked about in terms of the white supremacy, uh, women who've told to pl downplay their child care, as you mentioned, um, and the LGBT individuals who are told not to flaunt it. And of course, we see the rise of things like uh, um, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and all of these things during these during these pandemics, right? Uh, and during these historical moments. Um, and so, and uh, by by you talking about how many groups, right, covering impacts, uh, could you talk us talk to us a little bit about this idea of how we might um, have a civil rights paradigm shift? Because I'm thinking about the work of of John Lewis, right, who, told, who had this quote about us getting into good trouble, right, or the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, and I know you know uh, her work very well, and the concept of intersectionality. So could you talk to us a little bit about what a civil rights paradigm shift might look like in this idea of intersectionality and getting into <laughs> good trouble? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had the honor of meeting John Lewis uh, uh, a couple of times, you know, over the course of my career. And, uh, you know, he loved lawyers. So the first time I met him, you know, I think he was, you know, uh, just exhausted from having met all of these people before me uh, and we were sitting together. And then I happened to mention I was a lawyer and he lit up and he said, lawyers are so important. And you know, <laughs> let's talk about, uh, you know, the five things you can do as a lawyer to advance civil rights, you know. Uh, and then the next time I saw him, which is the only other time I saw him, he said, oh, you're the lawyer, you know, so he, he was actually such a wonderful, um, humane uh, individual. Um, so I will say that where I actually view um, his uh, necessary trouble line uh, coming in uh, to conversation with my work and the work of, of Kimberly Crenshaw is he was able to engage in necessary trouble, right? Well, at the same time, having a, a universalist vision of the kind of human family, right? So he simultaneously believed that he, you know, needed to carry the banner for his entire life for Black civil rights. But he had, you know, the vision that both, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X came to at the end of their career, where they both said, we thought we were fighting for civil rights, uh, but we actually were fighting for human rights for all human beings. So. One of the ways in which I actually came to know John Lewis was he was such a staunch ally and advocate for same-sex marriage right back when that was being so uh, ferociously fought and he created necessary trouble there as well. So I guess what I would say is that um, the way I think that this covering paradigm intersects with this work is that it both has a, has a universality to it and it has a particularity to it. So the universality point is that everybody covers, right? And I think that uh, John Lewis really stood for the idea that it wasn't enough just to make the necessary trouble for the group that you happen to belong to. It was also something that as a human being, you needed to call out injustice wherever you saw it. And that meant that you needed to be an ally, right? And the idea that covering is universal, you know, you're much more of an empiricist than I am. I'm not an empiricist at all. Deloitte, you know, did all of this uh, survey data for us. But what we found is that no cohort was immune from covering. Even 45% of straight white men reported covering you know, in the survey data. Uh, but I wanna contrast that 45% of straight white men who covered with the uh, 79% of black respondents or the 83% of LGBT respondents who reported covering on that survey. All right. 
So that takes me to Kimberly Crenshaw, because even though we need to operate at the universal level and say everybody covers, you know, everybody has advantages and disadvantages, you know, this is a point about privilege, right? When I say you're privileged to somebody that's often received as all lights turn green for me down the highway and it, you know, triggers what Dolly Chug talks about in her book is a hard knock life effect of like, let me tell you all the ways in which I've suffered. Right. Whereas I'm not saying that when I say you're privileged, I mean, on this particular dimension, you have privilege and other dimensions, you don't have privilege. And we all have a mix of privileges and disadvantages. But all that said, you know, just because everybody has disadvantages, just because everyone covers doesn't mean that there aren't some groups that have a harder time in life. Right. And that we shouldn't draw, you know, this uh, equivalence between all groups, because if we do that, then you know, everyone covers becomes all lives matter, right? And you elide the real uh, forms of subordination that exist in our society. So one of the things I admired about John Lewis was that he was also able to go really granular and to say, that was his initial conversation with me, like here are the five things that you can do as a lawyer. Right? <laughs> Actually go really operational and really specific, right? I'm talking about uh, matters of substance. And I think Kimberly Crenshaw is an inspiration in doing that because her intersectionality work really comes out of really a flaw in the way that we think generally, but in particular legal actors think. Because I think her inspiration for coming up with intersectionality was looking at this uh, de Graffenrind case, you know, where she looks at employment discrimination. The judge says, has there been race discrimination? He says, no, there hasn't been race discrimination because I see, you know, that some black men have made it into executive rank. And then he says, okay, we're done with the race discrimination claim. Now let's talk about whether there's sex discrimination. And he says, no, there's no sex discrimination because some white women have made it to the executive ranks. And so he dismisses the case. There's nothing left to talk about. And her contribution is to say, have you noticed that one group hasn't been discussed and that's women of color, right? So black men may be, you know, okay in this organization. You know, white women might be okay, but women of color are not, particularly a black women, right? And so hence intersectionality was born. And intersectionality is really this very granular approach, right, uh, that John Lewis also espoused. And when we look at the covering data, it's really interesting because I asked Deloitte, again, I'm not empiricist, so I, I, I tasked them with doing this. And I said, you know, I'm actually curious because the late great Kathy Phillips actually challenged certain aspects of uh, the intersectionality theory saying, could there be instances in which black women could be advantaged over black men or white women and say engaging in dominance displays? Because if you have competing stereotypes of, you know, black men or, too, or African Americans are too dominant and women are too meek, you know, that if you have a black woman that those, uh, you know, stereotypes would counteract each other and cancel each other out. And from the beginning, I just want to say true confessions. I was like, color me skeptical, Kathy. <laughs> I'm not persuaded that this is the case. I'm much more you know, of the belief that this is like a double cloud and there's a compounding effect. So the first thing I asked Deloitte for was for a spider chart that said, give me the four axes of covering and then give me these four demographics, white men, white women, black men, black women, and create a spider chart for me for how big or small the diamonds are. And the outermost bound was 0% covering. So a bigger diamond was a better diamond. And what we saw was that white men predictably had the biggest diamond. They engaged in the least amount of covering along the four axes. And then white women were very tightly nested within them. And that actually comports with Frank Dobbin, this is, this is Harvard's work, right, on how white women are the first beneficiaries of DNI initiatives. Then there was a big jump to black men, and then nested within black men were black women, right? But the biggest jump was between whites and blacks, right? And then there were internal jumps between white men and white women, and then a jump between black men and black women. So I looked at this chart and I was like, at least with regard to covering, this supports Crenshaw's theory much more than it supports the uh, Kathy Phillips, you know, theory of canceling out. So it's, the double cloud theory was borne out by this data much more than the canceling out theory was. So to sort of um, put a button on that, you know, what I'm trying to say here is like, one of the things I admired about John Lewis was his range of trying to think about this in universalistic terms. Like I really believe that he thought about human beings as human beings and uh, us as being part of a human family. But then he was also able to drill down at the most granular level to say, you know, there's certain kinds of oppressions that we need to talk about and we'll be talking around them if we don't talk about them directly. And I take Kimberly Crenshaw's instruction to us about intersectionality to say, 
you know, what I so admire about her was that she was really, people went after her saying like, you know, you are breaking ranks with feminism, right? To talk about black women or women of color and to put their needs, like you're, you're balkanizing us. So you're sapping strength away from feminism by doing this work. Right. She was actually very brave and speaking up for herself and has proven to be before her time because now what we're realizing is unless we talk about women of color, unless we talk about other forms of intersectional identity, there's no way that we can actually remedy the harms that attend to that particular cohort of individuals because there are stereotypes that attend to that particular cohort of individuals that are not attributed to either black men or to white women. Right? So it's a very John Lewis y type project, right? It and is, it is. That's right. That's right. I mean that's why I put I mean, you know, the questions I, you know, are curated. So um, so, can, so I, um, I do want to remind our audience, we're going to turn to have some live questions. And so if you can drop your questions in the Q&A, please do. And we'll turn to those momentarily. So I have a couple more questions for you. And um, so we're in the middle of a pandemic. We've had pandemics before. Um, and one of the pandemics that you raise in the book that um, I too, uh, you know, lived through and worked with buddy system and all of those things was the AIDS pandemic. And what is particularly enlightening was how you illuminate the way in which AIDS transformed the figurative equivalence between passing and passing away into a literal one. Literal death was met with silence. And in 18, uh, 1986, AIDS caused the death of more than 16,000 Americans, but few obituaries listed AIDS as a cause of death. And we know we're ex experiencing, as I started this, a pandemic today. Uh, the differential impact on communities of color during the AIDS pandemic was tragic. And we're seeing those differential impacts again today. Might you talk to us a little bit about the role of the state and the silences associated with, with the AIDS and uh, HIV pandemic during this era and make some connections to maybe some things you see today? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that question and for all of these um, friendship questions. So, uh, I, I actually, so I want to begin in a strange place, which is by saying, Lisa, we've known each other for a long time. I hope you don't think of me as an angry person. Because, <laughs> I, uh, do I do not. Uh, I do not. Uh, in fact, I was, I was, uh, I hope jokingly told by my executive director that I was creating a, a climate of toxic positivity, you know. <laughs> Um, because I'm generally pretty upbeat. But one of the I, I have to admit, I've been sort of accused of a similar kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I, I will remain angry about till my dying day, I fear, is um, the, silence, the governmental silence under the Reagan administration with regard to yeah. Me too. Yeah. And, and that is something that I, um, uh, I will certainly not forget. And I, I hope that someday I am enlightened enough to forgive. But you know, not yet, right? Uh, and, and so I, I, I've been thinking a lot as other thinkers like Andrew Sullivan have about, you know, the relationship between that pandemic and the uh, pandemic that we're dealing with today. And in some ways, um, there are dissimilarities in that uh, the coronavirus um, is much more, um, hits a much broader spectrum of individuals. So it's very, it's much harder to say uh, this is uh, GRID, right? Originally it was called, the AIDS was called gay-related immune deficiency, right? So it was seen as tag Oh, I remember them all, GRID, ARC. I remember it every, <laughs> As does Dr. Fauci, right? Because he right. was a hero then. That's right. I mean, where there's power, there's resistance. And, you know, where there are villains are also heroes. And he has been an incredible force uh, then as now. Um, so there are certain ways in which um and i actually don't give unfortunately people a lot of moral credit for this uh because i see the same blind spots i think it's just a demographic issue that because this is hitting a much broader population that it's harder to remain silent about it so we're hearing much much more about it because it's not localized to a particular population right of course there are attempts to do that you know thinking about you know uh, so I won't actually repeat the epithets, but, you know, attaching it to Asia uh, and saying that it came from China and uh, we've seen a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. But 
to my mind, from where I sit, it's not nearly the same attachment between the virus and a particular population. And certainly the notion is that the general population, right, is affected by this. And so the government needs to speak up. So that's the difference, right? And it's a, you know, it's, it's a good difference in that at least we're talking about it. But the similarities that I see that continue to trouble me, right, and anger me, frankly, are, you know, we, we again see um, a, a kind of killing indifference, right, towards the disparate impact that COVID has on particular populations. So I'm now thinking not about uh, the gay community so much as uh, black and brown communities. Right? And also it's not silence, but it is misdirection and obfuscation and denial, right, on the part of not just the federal administration, but, but also by many governors, right? So I think that we will look back on this time as a kind of Reagan redux moment, right? Where we do see uh, the same kinds of moves of I'm not gonna talk about it, or if I talk about it, I'm gonna downplay it, right? Or if I talk about it and don't downplay it, right? I'm gonna engage in revisionist history to say I was always- I'm gonna blame the victims, right? Yeah, when, you know, we can play the video that says you weren't for masks, you know, for um, uh, some some period of time ago, or to your point, yes, I'm going to blame the victims and say, you know, this is actually your fault, right? Because uh, I don't even know, you know, what the you know logic. I, I'm not even going to try to follow that very polluted stream of consciousness. But we see a lot of the same moves being made today, right? So, I think the biggest difference between um, AIDS and COVID is that because it hits a broader spectrum of the population or is perceived to hit a broader spectrum of the population, the silence has not been as sustainable, right? But in terms of the governmental responses, I think that we see more similarities and differences, unfortunately, right? And that, that is a cause of um, not despair, but it's a cause of real anger, right, uh, in me. And I, and I think that we just need to call that out as, as we see it. Thank you. So I'm actually going to turn to, I'm going to come back to uh, my final two questions at the end, but I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we're getting from, from the audience. So uh, one of the questions that we have is, um, and I'm reading them verbatim, so, um, so one of the questions we have is, how has the assimilation, assimilationist bias of the law's focus on immutable characteristics evolved since you authored your book covering? What are promising trends that you see, or what are some not so promising trends? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> again, this is a kind of history repeats itself uh, thing. So one semi-promising trend, I suppose, is uh, with regard to immutability, is that there does seem to be some greater understanding of uh, how immutability arguments are often implied apologies. So, you know, as um, Leo Bersani says, you know, validity and immutability, you know, moot each other, right? So, so something is immutable, like ought implies can, so you can't argue about its validity, it just is, right? But on the other hand, if something is valid, we don't often question whether it's immutable. We're not, we don't, we're not as conscious of like how people came to be that way unless we think that they ended up the wrong way, right? So that to me makes me feel like uh, the way in which we should be arguing issues like you know, sexual orientation or gender identity should be much less about immutability because it's an implied I can't help it argument, which says if I can help it, I will help it. And much more on you know, the gay is good right, uh, uh, domain right, of like sexual orientation is neutral right, and it's just as good to be gay as it is not to be gay. Uh, and the validity is a rising tide that lifts all boats. Because, you know, for example, if you believe only in immutability, then uh, bisexual individuals, even if they're immutably bisexual, are still construed to have some kind of choice, right? And so unless you make the argument about validity, then their same-sex attachments are gonna be devalorized, right? So I'd much rather argue this out on grounds of validity rather than on immutability. And I think that we've made some progress on that front. Um, in terms of where we haven't made progress, um, I would say that it's always two steps forward, one step back. So I, I, even as I believe that our conversations about sexual orientation and gender identity have advanced so that we're no longer talking as much about immutability, we see you know, the same kinds of moves made uh, by really critical decision makers. So you know, the line in Obergefell, which was otherwise an opinion that I celebrated, the same-sex marriage decision in 2015, 
was that made me kind of uh, wince was when uh, Justice Kennedy said homosexuality is an immutable characteristic. And I was like, oh, you know, face palm, right? Because like, I don't want that to be the ground on which uh, gay people are given uh, equal rights. There are doctrinal reasons for those lawyers who are out there. I wanna be careful to acknowledge why he would say that, uh, it, given that immutability and political powerlessness and a history of discrimination are uh, kind of factors that the court has taken into account in deciding whether or not a group gets heightened protection under the Equal Protection Clause. But still, I wish he had sort of moved away, right, from that discussion. In the scientific community, I still see all the same kinds of twin studies or brain studies in the gender identity context that I see in the sexual orientation. Yeah. So people saying, look, you know, if you, in the same way that we saw the the brain studies that say, look, you know, gay people's brains are, are hypothalami are smaller, right? So they're more like women's hypothalami and gay men. It's just like, oh my goodness, you know, this is the ground in which we're gonna, you know, is this the hill on which we're gonna die or live, right? Uh, but we see exactly those same kinds of brain studies being trotted out with regard to gender identity. And, you know, it's, I'm not impugning the work of those scientists at all. Like, you know, it's, it's not that I think that, um, I'm not even qualified to say whether they're right or wrong, whether science is good or bad. But I, I think in some ways, like, I, I mean, no answer is what the wrong question begets, right? And I think that the, the right question here to ask is, is sexual orientation and gender identity something to celebrate with regard to the diversity of forms it takes? Or is it something where the only response that we can give in order to persuade people that you know, our, you know, colleagues who are gay or our colleagues who are trans can muster is that they can't help it. You know, I don't want the implied apology to be the grounds of their acceptance or our acceptance, really. Thank you very much, Kandyak. Very well said. So let's, uh, I have a question here about social media and government silence. So I think this is piggybacking on some, what, some of the things we were talking about earlier. So in relation to the silence of the state, on the deaths of disenfranchised groups due to various pandemics that have taken place across American history. Do you feel that social media is playing a more important role now to shift this? Because some people seem to, more, to care more about the media reports. Do you think that the weight of government silence is the same now as it was during the AIDS pandemic? Yeah, that's a wonderful question and something I'm gonna have to think about more before uh, I give a sort of truly considered response, but uh, to give an off the cuff response, I would say, you know, absolutely. I think that information is so much more easily available. You know, I was laughing um, when I was reading uh, Ijoma Oluo's book, you know, so you want to talk about race. Uh, and she was saying, you know, cause people are always like, oh, you know, how educated do I have to be? Like, do I really have to read a book? You know, <laughs> you know I take her answer to wonderful, right? Which is to say, on the one hand, yeah, you kind of do, right? Is her stern response, right? You either care about this or you don't. Like, I can't say, like, I really care about understanding more about the First Amendment, but I, I don't want to read. So do I really have to read a book on it? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I hear her more gentle answer to be, a lot of the things that you don't know about are things that are just a Google away, right? So I, I want to actually not just think about social media, but about technology generally here, right? And so information is more available. And so if you don't know what Juneteenth is, if you don't know what the 1619 project is, uh, you can just Google it, right? And it's just a Google search away. And she says, if we have to live it, you can at least Google it, right? Which I think is a wonderful line, right? Uh, and so that information allows us to uh, be more forthcoming. With regard to social media, you know, thinking about Twitter and Facebook and what have you, you know, I guess we would have to sort of, you know, fight our way through the thicket of, you know, the counter arguments of, uh, all of the, you know, fake news that's being disseminated really quickly, right? So this is like, you know, social media has made it so that, you know, has amplified the effects of like a falsehood can make it around the world before the truth can even get its boots on, you know, idea of, you know, uh, untruths can get disseminated really quickly. And because of um, clickbait, you know, uh, practices, uh, it's much easier for a sensationalistic false story to make the rounds and for a true story to make the rounds. But on that, I agree with uh, what I take to be the implication of the question, which is like, we are, we do have an additional tool to fight back with against governmental indifference and silence that we didn't have before, right? Which is, you know, social media, uh, um, you know, whether that's Twitter or Facebook, but more broadly, I would say technology, you know, for me, you know, it's, it's really, 
the fact that we have cameras on our phones now. Like I think when we look back on history, this moment is gonna be you know, in part understood to have been created simply because we have cameras at the ready, right? So that we can actually you know, take a video and that, or that Christian Cooper can take a video of Amy Cooper in Central Park. So it's not just his word against hers, right? In which case that would not have ended the same way. I'm totally confident, right? right. Uh, and so that if we have all these videos of George Floyd, which are really, I know, traumatizing to look at, but really, really important in the cause of, of social justice so that it's not just a, you know, subjective recounting of one person's word against another, but there is documentary evidence that can then be disseminated through social media. So if we take that question in its broadest sense of technological changes, I do think that social justice movements have been greatly empowered um, by the, the availability of that technology. Thank you, Kenji. So Kenji, we're at 119, just as a time check. And so I'm gonna have two more questions for you, basically. I'm gonna combine a couple questions uh, that have been asked with, with the, my final questions that you have. And I have one question right now from the audience, um, which is, do you see the constitutional components such as human dignity clauses and anti-discrimination clauses as effective ways to reduce inequalities? Could I have the question again? Yeah. So you, do you see the constitutional components such as human dignity clauses, the clauses pertaining to human dignity, or clauses pertaining to anti-discrimination as effective ways to systemically reduce inequalities? Um, yes, comma, right? And, <laughs> yeah. Right, if we live up to our ideals, yes, right? So the, I, one of the things that's amazing about our constitution, given that I um, celebrated it so much, right, um, without actually defending my answer, so, so let me do that now. One of the things I love about the Constitution uh, is the level of abstraction at which it operates, or the levels of abstraction at which it operates. So when we get to the structural provisions, this is Stephen Carter's point about the Constitution. When you get to the structural provisions of the Constitution, which lay out you know, the charter of government, it's actually super specific. Like you've got to be 35 years old, right, to be president. And like that's just in black and white, right? And so nobody comes and says like, well, people didn't live as long then. So that age should really be 45 in today's year. It's like, <laughs> right. nobody really does. At this point, we're living until we're 115, so. <laughs> uh, and so that, there's that kind of crisp, you know, demarcation. Carter makes the point that when we move to the rights part of the constitution, we deal in abstraction. So the constitution suddenly gets more abstract. So it talks about no state shall deny any person the equal protection of the law, right? Um, you know, the due process clause, the free speech clause, the free exercise clause, you know, they're all very, very abstract. And he says, this may reflect or betoken a difference in sensibility and intent with regard to the structural provisions and the rights, sort of the dignitary protecting, uh, the dignity protecting provisions, because the structural provisions are very specific and the human rights aspects are very, um, abstract and kind of high polluting and in the ether. And I want to interpret that difference in generality to be intentional. And I want to say that the reason that they pitched, right, say the Equal Protection Clause at the level of equal protection, not just on the basis of race, but like equal protection of the laws, was to make it capacious enough to be left at the intelligence of subsequent generations so that each generation could determine what equality meant in their time. And we've actually lived that. The Equal Protection Clause has been formally extended to protect women, right, starting in 1973, right, uh, and has been formally uh, extended to protect LGBT uh, individuals, or at least uh, gay and lesbian individuals, and then Title VII has extended protections to uh, trans individuals as well in the recent Bostock opinion, right. So I want to read the soaring kind of dignitary provisions of the Constitution in exactly the way that this questioner is uh, framing it, right. All that said, you know, the Constitution is there, but it's only as good as the people who are interpreting it. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, these soaring provisions can be interpreted in such ways as to impugn the dignity, right, uh, that uh, I think a fair reading of the clause would, um, would require. So just as a, a really brief example, under disparate impact, right, I think we all know that uh, what matters in terms of making the lived lives of minority communities better right, is the impact that particular laws have on them, regardless of the intent with which they were passed. But beginning in 1976, the Supreme Court has driven a really firm uh, line in between intent and impact, saying uh, 
impact is irrelevant, only intent matters. So, so unless you can show that there was malign intent behind this law, the law will stand, even as it, if it has a totally disparate impact on a minority community. So you tell me, right, that 100 to 1 sentencing disparity, which has now been repealed, but legislatively, not judicially, right. uh, crack cocaine and powder cocaine, isn't sort of having devastating effects, you know, on Black communities, right? When we know that powder cocaine convictions are 90% plus white and crack cocaine convictions are 90 plus percent, you know, people of color, right? Then, you know, of course the impact matters, but we have a Supreme Court that says only intent matters and we don't see malign racist intent here. So that's where the too much justice quote comes back in, right? Which is to say, if we're not worrying about impact as well as intent, then we're still afraid of too much justice. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm going to combine a couple questions now so that we don't, uh, you know, literally run over time. So we have a couple questions that are uh, related to sort of students, right? Because we have students on the line. Um, and so I'm going to read this one question and I'm going to relate it back to one of the questions that I, that I have, which is we have a lot of students right now who are in high school taking courses, you know, in NYU's pre-college program. So they're all in line. And the writings of Goffman, Lacoff, Crenshaw, and others uh, concerned with issues of framing and how frames shape what is visible to us or not. Some of these students are asking questions um, and surely are asking questions about, you know, what, where are we now? How do we go forward? Um, so, and the, the uncertainty of where we are. And what, as you know, one of the other questions that, that, I ha that we have is, uh, how can we as non-legal experts, right? Uh, people who are out there in the audience take action and challenge and mobilize both the legal system, but you know the surrounding sort of that what informs the legal system to create better justice um, initiatives and to and to um, engage in transformative change. Great, uh, thank you uh, for that um, uh, to the students who are who are who are asking. So, you know what I'm going to say, Lisa. I'm going to say. <laughs> and you're asking this question, go to law school, right? Listen to John Lewis, listen to me, you know, come, come to me, you know, come study constitutional law with me. Right? Um, but, you know, that's a very um, serious <laughs> answer, but I, I, I think you want a, a, a more sort of broadband, you know, answer than that. And I guess I, I want to bring this full circle to where we began uh, with uh, covering. So, one thing that I don't think I did enough with is to relate covering to this current Black Lives Matter moment, right? And I will say that the reason that I wrote covering was because uh, I felt like the law wasn't doing enough, right? But by the end of the covering book, I say, I don't think that law is the answer here. So I don't give up on the law. I love the law as I hope I've made evident, uh, but this particular problem of covering is not something that the law is fine-grained enough to deal with. The law is a meat ax, right? So many of the issues that uh, the law can deal with are, you know, things like, okay, we're gonna legalize same-sex marriage. The law can do that, right? But the law can't sort of deal with the infinite and infinitesimal ways in which inequality manifests itself. It just can't catch up. It's not nimble enough or fine-grained enough to do that. So when I think about that, you know, I, I do think about all of these covering demands that are being made and one of the criticisms that I often get about covering is, oh, this seems like really ornamental. Is this the biggest problem we have to deal with today? And I was like, you know, when I get that, I think like, you know, I don't think it's the biggest problem, but it is a problem. So if we think about this pandemic, you know, just, you know, earlier this month, there was a really wrenching essay uh, written about by a black physician in the Washington Post, where he says that he wears his scrubs everywhere. Yes. Uh, because uh, he is stopped much less often if he's wearing his scrubs. That is covering. That is saying, I'm gonna be much more reassuring to you and I'm gonna rebut unconscious biases that you have about me if I supplant them with other you know, reactions that you have to you know, people who are physicians, right? Um, this is very similar to Whistling Vivaldi's. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The title of that book is derived from Brent Staples saying he whistles Vivaldi as a black man in order to create this highbrow reference, right? And then we can sort of, in the middle of those two examples, we have, you know, Trayvon Martin being told by Geraldo Rivera that he wouldn't have gotten killed if he hadn't been wearing a hoodie. So talk about blaming the victim, right? So for those who would say, you know, we actually think covering is epiphenomenal or not that important or tangential, I want to point out that in this moment, a lot of individuals are saying, this is a life or death decision for me, right? Whether I cover or not can determine my life chances, right? And Brent Staples is saying that, Trayvon Martin is saying that, and that's 
uh, African American physician is saying that, right? So I just want to just tie tie that back. Once we get to you know these covering demands are so infinite and infinitesimal that I despair of law's capacity to keep up with them, then I think that's where everybody we all come in as individuals. Right? It is this infinite and infinitesimal point, right? That means that we're talking about microaggressions. That means we all have to mobilize. How do we mobilize? We mobilize as allies. So the one thing that I'm like pounding my table on, like the one thing that I want is better allyship practices, you know, coming out of my center of like, we all have to understand that, you know, the allyship uh, relationship is a triangle, you know, there's the ally, there's the affected person, and there's a source of non-inclusive behavior, right? And what we call the empathy triangle means, and you don't need to have a law degree to do this. In fact, it's probably better if you don't have a law degree. <laughs> You're either in one of those three positions and it's a game of musical chairs, right? So it's either I saw it, it happened to me, or I didn't, right? And I think that what we're trying to educate people to do at the center is to say, you know, interrupt bias wherever you see it as an ally, but do it in a smart way. And that means that you have obligations to yourself. Am I informed enough to act? Am I, you know, doing it with the right motivations, not to be a savior or not to swoop in and save somebody, not as a noblesse of leash, but I have a genuine desire to advance social justice, questions to direct towards the affected person, like barreling in without asking your permission or advice. And then finally, and most controversially, I haven't tried this on you yet, Lisa, so I'm curious <laughs> about your reaction. Your responsibility is an ally to the source, right? You don't need to be an ally to Amy Cooper, but you do need to be an ally to your colleague at NYU or your classmate at NYU who's trying to defend Amy Cooper. And you have to start from a position of trying to empathize separating intent from impact, separating what they are saying from who they are, right, and not canceling them. You have to, at least as an initial position, engage with them and try to grow past, right, that non-inclusive behavior together. And if that seems unpersuasive to those of you who are listening, remember this is a game of musical chairs and someday you will be the source of non-inclusive behavior. So I always tell the story and I realize we're almost out of time, but I think this is a good place of humility uh, in which to end. I am often the source of non-inclusive behavior and the deepest, darkest ways in which, you know, I have messed up are things that I'm too, frankly, ashamed to share, you know, in this forum. But I will share, you know, a more anodyne example, although it's still pretty terrible, of the first three classes when I taught my leadership diversity and inclusion class, I confused the three Asian American women in my class. I am Asian, I'm teaching diversity and inclusion, and yet I'm routinely calling them by each other's names for the first three classes. And then finally, I have to hit the pause button and say, I'm glad I taught you about allyship because I'm the source. I'm the source of non-inclusive behavior. You need to call me out and you need to be an ally to me, right? And I will try to be an ally to you. If, if you can find it within yourself to be an ally to me, I would really appreciate it. It's actually what I, what I said. We got to a much better place, I think, than if that incident had never even occurred uh, in the first place because they were able to show me such empathy and compassion that we were able to think about it as a learning opportunity. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this, the one important thing that you could do, even if you're not a lawyer, is to think about your allyship practices. And our center has resources on this of thinking about how to be a better ally. Uh, but uh, as I know, uh, uh, you do as well, Lisa. But to think about your allyship practices and making sure that you're doing it in an intentional and careful skills-based way is the one thing that I would want to ask of this audience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yushino. We I cannot tell you how much we appreciate this conversation. I appreciate it. Um, and I want to just go back to one of the points. We've run out of time, but I do want to say this point about empathy. We're looking at these leaders across the globe who are doing really well. And so, um, and then of course, encourage people to also take your classes and to read your texts. Um, one of the things that's come out a lot in these um, talks is, you know, how do we educate ourselves? And to your point, and how do we how are we better allies um, and where do we recognize where we also, right, where we're not, as you say, um, where we might be the person who's um, sometimes not as inclusive as we want to be. So thank you again to our audience for being with us today. Uh, we will have, a, as I've said before, another conversation with Matthew Fry Jacobson on August 6th. Um, we do hope that everyone continues to take very good care of themselves, of one another, and engage in the work. Act, take classes, read, 
Go watch the videos of John Lewis, read the work of Lonnie Guineer, all the people that we've mentioned today and that our uh, Professor Yoshino has, uh, Yoshino has referenced many, many authors. So please, please, please uh, take the time to do, do the work. So thank you again, Professor Yoshino. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to my team. Thank you to all of you behind the scenes. And we look forward to seeing you at another one of these programs. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. It was an honor to be with you, as always. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care.